One in every four people in the United States has some sort of heart condition. One of every four. It's unfortunate, but it's a reality. It's one thing that we have actually grown to just understand that this is a part of what our culture has produced. One in every four. As we think about that statistic, uh, that means that just in this room, that one of us, it may not be today, may be later on in life, or maybe you have already passed it, will have some sort of heart problem. Be something that will go on that will disturb, disturb your living. See, problems with the heart, although they are common, they're still scary. We never really get used to this reality, that the thing that ensures that we stay alive, pumps blood through our entire body, there's a chance that something could go wrong with it. I, I can say personally uh, that I've experienced that. I remember a couple years ago, some of y'all remember this too, where uh, uh, with a lot of anxiety, I had gone into a doctor's office and gone to see a cardiologist and as I sat down with a cardiologist, immediately about a thousand pounds just landed on my shoulder. And as they took a look at the charts, as they had done some testing on me, they looked at me and, and said, I don't know when it happened or how it happened, but at some point, it looks like you had a silent heart attack. Now at 32 years old, I, I, I was beyond scared. It's something that, that had never been in view for me was in view, that I could actually not only know that I was mortal, but I could feel it, that there was something ahead of me that I, I, I honestly was just scared of. Now, let me just tell everybody, uh, God, I believe, healed me. They went and did some other tests. They said, well, we don't know what happened. I said, I do. I know what happened. God is a healer. And, and I've already told y'all about Kim Yada's testimony. He healed her heart, and I believe that he is in the healing business. But in that moment, in that moment, I was scared to death. I, I didn't know what to do and how to process all of that. I, a few of y'all know this about me as well, that I have health anxiety. And that health anxiety is, is actually, at the root of it, it's, it's just simply the same thing that all of us have. Like, I don't want to die. Like, I, not only do I not want to die, I don't want to go through the process of dying. I never want to experience that. I think at the root of all of that is um, the first time I heard about death. I might have been three or four years old. My maternal grandfather, Clyde Thomas Austin, had a heart attack in the middle of the night. They lived about 40 minutes from the closest hospital and he didn't make it. For all of my life, that's just kind of sat over my head I never really realized how much it impact, impacted my story. But a lot of my anxiety, my fear, even some maybe we call depression, is rooted in this, this fear of, of death and, and this fear of death being related to a problem, a heart problem. In the text, in the text, uh, we're introduced to a heart problem. Jesus immediately he goes to this issue of there being a problem in the heart. And we know the problems of the heart, <laughs> they have existed as long as human beings have existed. Why? Because all of us are outside of the garden. See, the garden was perfect. It was beautiful. Y'all hear it in every single sermon. Genesis 1 and 2, perfect, good. I, I would have loved it. I would have loved being there. I thought about this the other day. Like, how quick could you make a smoothie in the garden? Like all the, every, all the vegetables are good. Like everything is good. The smoothies are good. You know what I hate about smoothies? I'm on a tangent. I don't like cleaning up afterwards. In the garden, would not have to clean up. Everything was good. Sin messed it up. And how do we, how do we get put outside of the garden? A heart problem. It was a heart problem. See, we, we try to say, okay, it was just a sin problem. We were tempted by sin, and so we opted in. And yes, sin did pull us out of this perfect garden. But, but before it was a sin problem, it was a heart problem. Because Adam and Eve decided that what was in their heart was that they wanted to be God 
they didn't want to wait on God to be God. That there was something of you that they wanted in their heart that was more important than what was their reality at the time. We can have perfection in this life, and yet if our heart has a problem, we will never have peace. They had heart problems. We have heart problems. When I was sitting in that doctor's office, I, I felt like my heart was troubled. And a troubled heart is a heart that's shaken to the core. It's filled with fear. It's, it's upset. It's, it's disturbed. It's terrified. When we think terrified, we, we think that there is a, a monster in the closet somewhere ready to jump out at us and, and shock us and, and then we go off running. But most of the terror that's in our lives is about what could happen to us in the future. What God would allow for us to face. Not the darkness we've seen, but the darkness that we have not seen. Our heart problems are connected to those things. Terror is connected to those things. The trouble of the heart is connected to those things. It's, it's our fear. And I'll say this, a troubled heart is one that's overwhelmed, consumed, and often overflowing with the fear of what comes in life's untamedness. I don't even know if that's a word, but we're gonna use it this morning. See, see, the garden was perfect. It was tame, but outside of the garden was not. There was untamedness, and that's where our fear comes in. Because when things aren't tamed, they are not under control. So we have fear. Some of us have fear about dying, but some of us have fear about living. Some of us have fear about justice, that God would actually do what he should do in a certain uh, time or place, and we might not be right with him yet. But, but many of us are, are fearful of injustice. That even though we did the right thing, we believed the right thing, God, God still pulled our card. Fear. Fear is natural. Fear is natural. But God is supernatural. And what God does with our fear is pulls us into a system of care that can transform our lives from being people who live in our fear to people who live in peace. Fear enters the chat whenever hope is not in view. When we feel like God cannot do this, he will not deliver me because of this. I've sinned too much for him to heal my body. I've done too much for him to heal my mind. When hope is out of view, fear, fear enters. So I imagine, I imagine this is how the disciples felt. See, in John chapter 14, Jesus has, Jesus has just gotten done washing their feet. Their feet are literally still tripping. And yet they are confronted with the reality that Jesus must leave them. See, we, we think about them spending three and a half years with their rabbi and we get excited. I can't imagine what it would be like to walk with Jesus for that amount of time. Could you imagine saying goodbye? Could you imagine knowing the agony that he would face, the, the pain that he would face, and the pain that you would face when he leaves you? We deal with that right now. We've never seen Jesus in the flesh. None of us have. If you have, come to me at the end. I want to talk a little bit. But none of us have seen Jesus face to face. And yet all of us hurt when we cannot feel him. So imagine the disciples knowing that Jesus is their savior, their rabbi, and their prince of peace, and now he has to leave. Not only is he going to leave, he's going to be betrayed. And not only is he going to be betrayed, he's going to be completely abandoned. That's what we see, John chapter 13. And it gets us to John chapter 14 because it's like Jesus knew. He knew what was uh, filling their hearts. He knew as he looked at his disciples that they were filling up with fear. What am I going to do now? Is my business still there? Will my family take me back? Is there another rabbi that I can follow? What do I do now? What does he say? Do not let your heart be troubled. Yeah. What? Jesus, what you mean don't let my heart be troubled? I'm troubled. Like, there's trouble out there. The only sense of peace I've had for the last three and a half years is walking with you. And there's been some scary moments then, too. Remember when we was out on the river uh, and we was in the boat and you was walking? and That was scary. Why? Because, because I wasn't in control and I felt like you weren't in control. 
And if we think about the fear in our lives, that's what it is. We don't have control and we feel like God hasn't had control. See, we like saying, Jesus, take the wheel until the car starts shaking. And then we say, no, 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 let me take the wheel back. And you realize you can't take the wheel back. When things get shaky, fear enters the chat because we know that hope is out of view. So when Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled, it sounds a little weird. But you got to look at it like this. Jesus isn't giving like encouragement. He gives three commands. Three. Look at them in the text. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Those are not suggestions. Jesus says these are commands. There have been times where I've given you wisdom. There have been times where I've given you suggestions. These are not those. And see, I love, I love us. I love people. I, I love sitting down, having coffee with people. And, and y'all, let, let me just tell you, you know, I got the same struggles as y'all. Y'all come and talk to me about it, and I'll be like, man, they don't even know. <laughs> I'm about to go home and cry. Because I'm human. And I live in this untamed world. And fear has filled my heart when hope is out of view. And I have to grab hold to the fact that Jesus, in the moments of our most anxiety, he doesn't give suggestions. He gives commands. You know, in the Old Testament, when they're about to go, go into this promised land, but he's like, yo, I got a land for you, land flowing with milk and honey. But it's people there and they might kill you. They don't like you at all because you're about to take what they have. Do not fear. For I'm with you. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. When Jesus is out on the waters and, and the waters are choppy, just like we talked about a couple minutes ago, he tells the waters, stop. Then he rebukes them. He rebukes the waters, then rebukes them. It's not a suggestion. It's command. Might I suggest, because I can't give the command, might I suggest that what you might need in life is not another word of encouragement. Maybe sometimes we should just listen to the commands that God has already put in front of us. Yeah. See, oftentimes, oftentimes we want to figure out how do we get around the command. Oh, God, God what can I, how can I get a, a C plus in obeying this? <laughs> like, what's a passing grade? Y'all sat in y'all professor's office in college. What do I got to do to pass? God's like, hey, sometimes the command is not to, for me to flex my muscle. Sometimes the command is so that you can hold on to me tightly. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Which is interesting because they already believe in God. We know this because they've been following this man for three and a half years. And all Jesus talks about is his father. Like they're looking for all of these things. And he's like, father, you know what? I'm going to go over here and pray by myself. And then I come and tell you what the father told me. You know that they believe in God. These are righteous men-ish uh, they're holy-ish men. They believe in God. Why is Jesus repeating this command? Oh, I think they believe in Jesus too. Like, would you follow somebody you don't believe in? I pray that you wouldn't. See, sometimes when, when Jesus puts these commands in front of his people, it's not that he is trying to give us something new. He knows how fleeting our hearts are. He knows how tempted we are to let go of the foundation that's there in front of us. He knows what it's like. See, when you're in a car, you're about to get in a car accident, you tense up and grab things. But funny, in life, when you're about to get in an accident or things get bad, you let go of things. Don't let go of God when things get shaky. Grab hold to God when things get shaky. This is the command. Continue to believe in God. Continue to believe in me. I'm leaving. These things will happen. You will experience pain. You will be abandoned. And yet, keep believing. That's the exercise. That's the command. Their belief in Jesus was built on a foundation, though, of what they had seen and experienced. Think about it. Jesus had stood in front of them. He, he turned the water into wine in front of them. That's the one I want to experience. He, they, he's walked on water in front of them. He's cured blindness in front of them. He's made lame people walk in front of them. What will you do when God's not in front of you? Will you continue to believe? How will you navigate these things? 
How do you regulate your heart? How do you find peace when Jesus isn't in front of you? And, and Jesus gives us, he gives us a formula of how to do it. See, Jesus ushers us into a system of care that pulls our hearts away from being troubled into a household of peace, a system of care. See, I told you all about me going to see the doctors earlier. It was not one doctor. It was several of them. And many of us have been there. We, we hate it at the time. But, but later on, when the news gets better, we love it. Because each and every stop, they're reminding you, ooh, you're getting better. Oh, yeah, you're getting better. That system of care is beautiful. Jesus ushers us into a system of care, which is, is what we need when we know that Jesus might not be there right beside us. We need a system. Systems are there to ensure that the goals are met even when someone else is not present. So as Jesus is exiting, he wants to bring us into this system of care. And before he does that, he casts a vision of this system of care. And he says, he says he's going to prepare a place for us. He talks about his father's house. Now, if I'm a disciple, I'm like, bro, I've heard about your dad. You talk about him a lot, but his house? I mean, I've always heard that he's going to tabernacle with us. I know that there's heaven, but isn't God going to be be with us. And he starts to talk about this house of God. I've heard this preached uh, several times. People talk about the many mansions that you're going to have a mansion and you, you're going to have a mansion. All y'all going to have a mansion. The text actually does not lend itself to say that. It's not about the room that you can occupy. It's about the God that you can be with. So the kingdom that's there, that's what you should look forward to. You waiting to get up there with your thousand foot uh, flat screen TV. You need to be thinking about the God that's going to be there waiting on you. He's saying, hey, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And guess who's already there? The father's there and I'll be there and the angels are there. So when you get there, you know that the place has already been prepared. It's nothing worse than going on a trip. And you get to a place that's not already prepared for you. I don't know if y'all travel a lot, but I, I, there were times where I used to travel a lot. And I love hotels. And there was nothing that grinded my gears worse than walking into a room. And my room hadn't been made up. It was not prepared for me. I went downstairs. I filed a complaint. Y'all going to have to put me in a suite now. Because I got Hilton Honors. Put me in a suite. And make sure it's prepared. I remember the first time I walked into a room and I had gone on a trip and they knew I was coming. So, so the people who had organized the whole thing, when I walked into the room, they had a, a bag with my name written on it. They had my favorite snacks in there. I mean, it was full of fruit snacks. The good ones, when the good ones. <laughs> fruit snacks and crackers and, and, and things that I like. I laid down on the bed and it was like, man, this is a bed that I like. This, this, this feels like it was made for Byron. It was prepared for me. See, but those things were prepared for my desires. Jesus prepares a place for our, our full essence. That the fullness of who we are, Jesus has already prepared a place in the heavenlies for us. So when we think about the fear of dying or the fear of of having troubles in life, we have to grab hold to the fact that Jesus is already gone where we're going. He's already prepared a place. The Father is already ready for us. He says he, he has a place in the Father's house. And he gives us a promise. Here's the promise, point number one. The promise of heaven is refreshing when we know the Father. The promise of heaven is refreshing when we actually know the Father. See, if heaven is heaven and it does not have our loving, holy father, then it ain't heaven. You can go to a place of bliss or paradise after you leave here, but it ain't heaven if it don't have God. And let me spoil it. It ain't no place like that because it ain't no place that's restful without God. See, our Father, our Father has spent time crafting a plan so that we might know him. This is Jesus' work. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If not, if there weren't many rooms, would I have told you this? Would I have told you I was going to prepare a place for you? 
And, and we know if we keep walking the text, verse 7, he says this, if you know me, you will also know my father. See, this is a problem. Because they're not supposed to know the father yet. See, they know a little bit about the father, but they don't know. See, this word know is a deep intimacy. We talked about this last week. We talked about how husband and wife should have this deep intimacy. And father and, and children should have this deep intimacy. What he says is, if you know me, if we've been tight all of this time, then you will know him. And he, he knows you. See, this is the goal, that we be deeply known by the father. And I understand that that's hard for some of us because many of us have struggled with being deeply known by our fathers. See, we all live outside of the garden, which means that all of us have relationships in our lives that are incomplete and not perfect. Some of us have experienced pain connected to our fathers, which makes it difficult to understand that our father in heaven is a perfect father. See, some of us in our uh, deficiency in, in having a good father on earth, we look forward to our heavenly father. But, but many of us, many of us, we struggle. We have fear about what this father is like because when we th- see the scriptures, we don't see a loving father. We see a commanding father. We see a father that puts a lot on our shoulders. We see a father that might leave us in certain times if we're not doing the right thing. No, that's what the earthly fathers may do. Our heavenly father does not do this. There's a man named Louis Giglio. Uh, he, uh, he has written a lot of books. I, uh, some of them are okay. Some of them, I, anyway, Louis Giglio wrote a book uh, and it was about fathers. And he outlines uh, six different kinds of earthly fathers that, that exist. And these six different kinds of earthly fathers, is, it usually points to how we interact with our heavenly father. And here, here are some of them, the absent father. Some of us have experienced that absent father. I mean, we don't know him. We, we haven't had any relationship with him. He, sometimes he lives down the street, and we still don't know him. He's absent. And our hearts are troubled because we want him. Our hearts are troubled because we need him. Our hearts are troubled because we want to be known by him. And yet he's never around. And we don't even know how to get him around. Then there's the passive father. He, he might be in the household, but he's not really present. Uh, He lets mom handle pretty much everything, and and he never sits down and talks with you, never takes you on a walk, takes you to the park. He never asks you what you like. He's passive. He cares more about what's going on in his life and his heart than he does about you. And those of us who had passive fathers, we've yearned, not just for his presence, but for his attention, for his love. And some of us have abusive fathers. Some of us have experienced physical and emotional abuse, some spiritual abuse, and there's not a lot to be said. Uh, Abusive fathers are not of God. They're not acting godly in any way, and yet there's something that they're missing, and they're passing their abuse on to their children. That's usually what it is, that abusers are usually those who have been abused. So here we are, having experienced that abuse from our fathers. And we yearn just to feel okay. We yearn to just not have to fight. And we want that love and attention. Conditional father. That's another one. He's present. He's active. He's with you all the time. But he treats you according to your activity, your character, the things you do right, the things you do wrong. Yeah. Yeah. When you get all A's, he's the greatest father in the world when you When you get kicked out of school just for talking back at the teacher, then he doesn't love you. People who have had conditional fathers, we treat our Heavenly Father that same way. We believe in the moments where where our life is eclipsed with sin, God does not love us. But in the moments where that sin pushes away and and we're doing our Bible studies and we're going to church and we're in community, oh, God loves me now. But when sin enters the chat again, he won't love me anymore. That's conditional love. Some of us have antagonistic fathers. They're always looking to start a fight. They always find something wrong. You're, you're a little bit too chubby or, or you've been eating too much or you need to go outside a little bit more. You need to study a little bit more. Why don't you work a little harder? And they're starting fights with you. They're demanding things from you. So you yearn for a father who will just leave you alone so that you could feel okay to be who you are. 
but our father. Our father is an empowering father. That he would not pick fights with us, abuse us. He would not allow for injustice to happen against us. He would not point to our physical appearance or our activity or our character. He would treat us better than what we deserve to be treated and not just love us. See, we run to the Father's love, but you have to know that just feeling loved sometimes is not enough. We want to feel empowered, that we could actually live for God, live this life. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, not only loves us, He empowers us. So even if our earthly fathers have failed us, Jesus says, if you know me, you know the heavenly father. If you want to see what God is like as a father in his fullness, look no further than Jesus. See, I hate when people, they read the Bible and they say, (laughs) see, the God of the Old Testament, he was harsh. He was demanding. Yeah, he... He was flexing his muscle. Like, he was, he was hard to please. But the God of New Testament, I love him. Like, Jesus, oh, man, Jesus is like washing feet and kissing babies and all of that stuff. He gets us, right? Like, he's, he's right there with us. I'm like, y'all ain't read y'all Bible. Because the God of the New Testament is the same God as the Old Testament. See, the God of the Old Testament is just as loving and caring. Matter of fact, he would tabernacle with us in earthly forms in different types of ways just so that we could experience him. The God of the New Testament is is just as demanding and fighting for justice. Jesus is the same way. They are one in the same. It makes me think about uh, uh, this movie NWA. Y'all ever seen it? All right. I don't know if this is good. Y'all ever seen that movie NWA? Okay. All right. Wrong illustration. There's a rapper, a rapper named Ice Cube. He comes from this group called NWA. I'm not going to tell you what NWA stands for. <laughs> but when they were casting for this movie NWA, they did something that I thought was great. They actually casted the son to play the role of the father. See, so when you look at O'Shea Jackson Jr., what you would think of is O'Shea Jackson Sr., Look at them. They, they're, they're, it's a splitting image of one another. So when I'm looking at the movie, and, and I'm not suggesting y'all look at the movie, but when I'm looking at the movie, I said, man, that, that reminds me of Ice Cube. That, that's really Ice Cube. That's, that's the real Ice Cube. God would send his son to tabernacle with his people so that every time you look at Jesus, you don't just see a new prophet or teacher or rabbi. You see God in the flesh. If you want to know what God is like, As a father, look at Jesus. He's walking around pointing at children saying, this is who you should be like. This little one who will enter the kingdom of God. Uh, John, in John chapter 1, he talks about Jesus in creation. That Jesus was there creating. Everything was made through him. If you think about Lazarus being raised from the dead, before he gets raised from the dead, Jesus sits with his family. And there's that one verse, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. If you're looking for compassion from a father, Jesus shows you exactly what the father was like. Hungry people got fed. Sick people got healed. People who dealt with injustice, they got their fair share when Jesus was around. If you want the care of the Father, look no further than Jesus. That's why he says in verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. He says, believe. You want God's love? Look no further than Jesus. He also gives a pathway. He wants you more than just seeing. He wants you to have peace. So point number two, the pathway to peace comes through the person of Jesus. If you're looking for peace, Jesus is the way to peace. And I know, I know y'all heard this before. I I know y'all know what the scripture says. I'm going to read it anyway. John chapter 14, verses 3 through 6, he says, If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may also be. I might have to go, but reconciliation will happen. You know the, you know the way to where I'm going, Jesus says. 
which I would have did the same thing that Thomas did in the text. Y'all know doubting Thomas. I, I love doubting Thomas because Thomas had a reason to doubt. He knew that he had put all his chips on Jesus and Jesus is leaving. If I, I don't gamble, but if I did and the person I gambled on left, I would be troubled. So when Thomas says, no, 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 you say we know the way. I don't know the way. I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I don't know where you're going. And when he says way, <laughs> he uses this word that I, I, I love because it's talking about like a pathway. See, we think of way and sometimes we think like a process, like a, that type of way. But he's talking about like a pathway. So when he uses this term, Thomas is like, no, no, no. I don't walk with you for a long time. I don't know the way. Right. Like, and he's looking for this Google Maps way. Like, show me this turn. Turn left now. Uh, I like Apple. Apple Maps is better than Google Maps. You drive down the street, it tells you exactly where you're going. Google Maps will get you in the middle of a field by yourself. <laughs> See, some of us are a little older, so we remember printing off that map quest. <laughs> I was my dad's Siri. <laughs> turn left now. <laughs> Sorry. We would love those type of instructions from God. We would love that type of map from God. God, I'm dealing with this right now. Do I turn left or do I turn right? Do I keep straight ahead? Do I stop? Oh, oh, this is an intersection. Let me slow down. That's what I would love from God. God does not give that. He says, no, no, no. Here's a pathway and you just follow this way. That's how they gave directions anyway at that time. Just follow this path. If you just stay on this path, you cannot go wrong. Well, do I turn right or do I turn left? No, no. Stay on the path. Our problem is that we want to turn. We're ready to move. We want to see something else. Stay on the path. This is what Jesus is saying. You already know the way. Thomas says, no, no, no. I don't know the way. And Jesus says right back to him, I am the way. Jesus is the pathway. He, he says, I am the way. I'm the truth and the life. You already know I'm true. We talked about that before. You already know I give life. We talked about that before. But the pathway to peace is me. And, and see, we think, oh, no, that's spiritual. That's spiritual. I'm going to be in here. I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to say amen. I'm going to go. And then tomorrow, I'm going to be praying to God about something else because I do not know the way. Have you tried the pathway of peace? which is Jesus. See, when Jesus says, I am the way, he, he's, not, he's not just pointing. He's not pointing away from himself. He's pointing to himself. He's saying, be like the way. See, Jesus is the way of God. He, he is the truth of God. He, he gives the life of God. God gives life through Jesus. Spiritual vitality comes through Jesus, and spiritual vitality is better than, than being asleep. See, some of us fear death, but some of us fear life. And, and some of us would rather be sleep until Jesus comes back than to actually follow the way. He gives us a pathway. He gives us a way to determine where we are in life and what we should be doing. This pathway of peace is a pathway following his instructions. What does he say? Continue to believe in the commands I've given you. Continue to walk your faith out the way we've been walking it out for the last three years. Continue to live by the book. Continue in that. We often think that there's more beyond this place when we have not even done this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Which they were probably cool with for about 30 seconds. And then their hearts yearned for more. Yeah, you're the way, but, but how do I get there? You're the way, but what do I do when I don't even have enough courage to take a step? Like, like when I feel like I'm chained to my bed in the morning because I'm so depressed. Like when I feel like I'm stuck in a world that's moving because I have so much anxiety. What do I do? And Jesus creates this system of care because point number three, he gives us the possession of peace through the walking with the Spirit. He gives us the possession of peace through walking with the Spirit. 
Jump with me to verses 15 through 17. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. What is he saying? If you love me, you'll walk on the way. Like you'll walk out the path. You'll walk these things out. If you truly love me, you'll continue on in the path. You, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Sometimes we need a counselor. Sometimes we need someone who can help interpret our feelings. I, I unloaded on my counselor this week. I said, hey, here's all the stuff that's going on. And you know what he did? He told me to sit and pray for five minutes. I ain't paying you for that. <laughs> Give me an answer. And I, I promise y'all, in, in, in minute number three, it hit me. Here's an area I'm not walking with Jesus or walking the way of Jesus. Here's a space where I have not tried to stay in step with the spirit. Here, here's an arena of life where actually I want what I want. Give me what I want, God. He's yeah. like, <laughs> nah. Because you want to take a right or a left. And I told you to stay on the way. And you're like, well, it's crazy up here. And he's like, but you got a guide. He's your counselor. He walks with you. He'll cry with you. He'll be with you. He'll help interpret your prayers so that the Father hears exactly what's on your heart. This is why we have a counselor. I love the counselor. Because the counselor will sit with you and say, nah, you tripping, but I got you. I'm going to get you right. And he comes over and says, hey, he tripping, but I got him. I'm going to get him right. That's what the counselor does. The mediator that Jesus was when he stood on this earth, the counselor plays that role right now. So when we don't feel comfortable, here comes the counselor. When we don't feel convicted, here comes the counselor. And you need conviction because sometimes it's your fault. And you need the counselor. Hey, bro, you were out of line. When you're overwhelmed by sadness, here comes the counselor. And sometimes it's not a word. Sometimes it's not any motivation. Sometimes it's just his presence. That's why Jesus says, I got to go. I got to go because the one who's coming, y'all need this. Because I have an assignment. My assignment is to sit at the right hand of the Father. I'm ready for the day where I come back. I will be in love with you, loving you from afar in the heavenlies. But the counselor, he walks with you every day. He's up before your alarm. He's with you while you sleep. The counselor is the one who brings you peace. And how does he do it? Why does he do it? He keeps you on the path. So you might be asking. How do I get the life with the counselor? How do I actually access this counselor? Who do I call? How many prayers do I pray? What do I do? The spirit, the spirit, the counselor is, is not a possession. The counselor is a person. He's a person who wants relationship. He wants to talk with you. He, he wants to be with you. When you get the call of that bad news, do you call your mama before you talk to the counselor? When things are just not going right in your heart, the, the counselor would rather you sit with him for a second than to go off and look for another, another thing. And there's sometimes where we will skip over the Holy Spirit to get to the Holy Scriptures because we want the answer instead of having the presence of the counselor. See, Jesus, Jesus says it's better. It's better for you to have this counselor because the counselor wants you. He'll walk with you. He'll be with you. And he'll ensure that you will not be taken out of Jesus's possession at all. This is the system of care. So as Jesus is heading toward the cross for your sins so that you don't have to pay for it, he says, the father the Father already did something in creating this plan and sending me. See, I'm going to do what I got to do, but I got to go too. But there's another who will be with you. The Trinity is there for more than just theological understanding. The Trinity is there so that you might understand the love of God fully with no interruptions. Verse 13. Verse 13, Jesus says, 
He says something that I think we like to put on coffee mugs or we like to say in prayer meetings that we really should look at in a, in a more bountiful way. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. See, I like, I like quoting that when, when I need something to move or shift or change. We should quote this when we really need to feel the presence of the counselor. If you are a person, I don't, I don't, I'm off my notes completely. If you are a person that does not feel the love of God, here's where I want you to start. He says, ask him anything. Why don't you ask him if the very real counselor would be with you in your life, that the spirit of God would move you shake you, convict you, comfort you in every moment of your life. In 18, he tells us, I will not leave you as orphans. You're cared for. See, an orphan, uh, if their parent leaves them, they're left to other people's care. And a foster parent or, or a foster agency, and, and they are cared for by the basic needs of life, but they're not loved. They're not truly paid attention to. They're not cared for like a parent. Jesus says, you're never an orphan. I am always with you. And that's the reason why I have to come back for you. Why? Verse 27 and 28. Peace I leave with you. My peace I will give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be fearful. You have heard me tell you I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. The fear that you have, the tiredness that you have, the pain that you have, know that the answer, the answer is Christ leading you on the way with the Spirit. As we wrap up, I, I just want to wrap up like this. We like application in messages. We love when we get the, all right, silent prayer and give a little bit more and, and be in community and and do all of those things. All of those things help. But none of those things have power. Unless you have God. Look at verse 31. Just the last thing I'll give you this morning. As Jesus is wrapping up this chapter. He's talked about fear. He says this. On the contrary. So that the world may know that I love the Father. I do as the Father commanded me. Hear the words that I want you to hear. Get up. Let's leave this place. If you're housed by fear right now, get up. Let's leave this place. I, I know that Jesus was giving direct commands to his people that they might actually go to another physical place. But I think those words can be applied in this way. The spirit is in your life if you believe in Jesus. Get up. Leave your depression. Get up. Leave your anxiety. Get up. Leave your fear. Is it easy? No, it's not. Is it a simple process? No, it's not. But you know what gives hope in those times? Actually believing and following in the way, the truth, and the life. So get up. Move outside of the place that's giving you the most fear. And walk the pathway of peace. And our God, who says that you can pray anything to the Father, he will give it to you. Especially if you're asking for more of him. We wrap up all our gatherings at the table. And we come to the table because before Jesus goes to the cross, he lays out the truth of the gospel. That he would give his body over for us. He would 
drop his blood to the ground for us so that we might not just believe in him and receive something, but so that we might have oneness with him. So as you take the bread, you are taking on the reality that you are one with Jesus. He is your way. He is the truth. He is the life. As you take on that bread and you drink of the wine, you are saying, you are saying, I believe in this pathway. But before you take them, here's my challenge to you. Take Jesus up on that, that, that request about prayer. Ask him. Stop stressing about it. Ask him. Before we take him, you ask him. He is our way. He is the truth. He gives life. We start right here in the front. You're more than welcome to come, grab your elements, go back to your seat, spend a, a little bit of time just meditating, talking to the God who wants to know you. And if you don't feel like you know him, Here's what your ask should be in prayer. God, I want to know you. Your word says that you're real. I feel something, but I, I, I don't quite feel peace. I want to know you deeply. I believe that Jesus actually died for my sins. I want to walk life out with you. Will you be with me? Listen for the voice of God. Then after a few moments, we will take the Lord's Supper together by way of uh, scripture. And then I'll, we'll have a few more minutes to just meditate, listen for God. He will show up. He will answer you. You're now welcome to come feast upon our Lord.